Okay class, it's time for module 16. We're going to be talking about vegetables again. And this time we're talking about solanaceous vegetables. Now the solanaceous vegetables are interesting because they are part of the deadly nightshade family, or Belladonna. Now, yeah, this has got a long history of being involved in witchcraft and all this kind of stuff. Yet some brave soul was hungry enough one day to take a bite out of a tomato, and he lived. So they started eating tomatoes, right? So let's talk about some of the solar characteristics of uh, the Solanaceae family. They do have an alternating leaf arrangement. So as you go up the stem, there's going to be one and then another as it goes up. They have a, the vegetative parts contain alkaloids. Now this is where the problem comes in with them being poisonous because these alkaloids are chemical compounds and some of them are like nicotine and caffeine, which you know, they can maybe give you a little uh, uh, rise in your mood, but they can also kill you if you take too much of them. Now, uh, most solanation uh, plants have solenoid, which is the main product. Tomatoes have a thing called tomatine, which is not quite as deadly, but it can make you sick. And some people who have immune problems should not eat tomatoes. So that's an interesting thing to know. The flowers, they can be solitary or clustered, and their petals are always in groups of five. Um, the petals and sepals are infused to make one unit, and the fruit is a berry or a capsule. And a berry is simply a fleshy fruit with many seeds, derived from a single ovary of an individual flower. So think of a tomato, it's definitely a capsule, you cut it open and there's many seeds inside there. Some common solanaceous vegetables include the eggplants. We have a few different kinds here. Again, the varieties, it's interesting how they selected over the years to come up with a similar plant that makes different kinds of fruit. Then you have your peppers, your tomatoes, and again, tomatoes come in all different sizes and color, and the peppers as well. It's good to know, as Dr. Doak mentioned before, it's good to know what to expect to find when these plants are ready so you know when to pick them because some of these, uh, you know, if you've got a purple bell pepper, you want to make sure you pick it when it's purple. Uh, and you know that it turns purple, then it's what it's supposed to do, right? So an interesting thing about uh, potatoes is that, well, we eat the fruit with these uh, potato with the peppers and the eggplant, we're actually eating the modified stems of the potato. Now, potatoes grow underground so they're blocked from the light. So the solenoids that we're talking about don't develop on the ground without that light. But if you ever see a potato that's uh, grown too close to the surface and it's got sun, it'll actually turn green. Now the green part of that potato does contain those solenoids and you should not eat it. So you should always cut away the green portion of the potato if you see it. The growing conditions, uh, this is a warm season crop. So all of these things like to be grown from the, after it warms up in the spring, through the fall. The seeds will germinate as low as 60 degrees, so that makes it a bit, uh, easier for us to start them early, before it's time to put them out. We usually want to start them inside. The optimal temperature is about 65 to 85 degrees. We do transplant these plants into the garden. We do. Um, the tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, they do much better as transplants. But with potatoes, you actually go ahead and plant the, uh, the, the vegetative part of that potato in the ground, and that's what you use as its seed, it's the actual potato itself. They do like warm, well-drained soil, rich in organic material. Again, most of our crops like that, uh, that good, healthy soil we talked about. With the ideal pH between 5.8 and 6.7 for the tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, which is pretty low, that's definitely on that acidic side. But for potatoes, they like it really acidic down at 4.8 or 5.4. So you can see that's a that's a lot different. Our native soil around here tends to be closer to seven. So very often we do need to uh, add those amendments to bring it down for that. And also growing in containers is a good thing for these because then we have better. Uh, better control over that pH. The sunlight, they do need six to eight hours of minimum of direct sunlight. Uh, you can try to grow these things in the shade, you're just not going to get very good results. You know? uh, 
They need that energy to produce these offspring. You can do your soil test for the pH again and also for the soil uh, fertility recommendations. As I said before, there's a, a lot of nutrients in our soils. We don't need to keep adding things that are already there. Generally, when we're fertilizing our tomatoes, they like to be fertilized at the planting. They also like to be fertilized again at the first fruit set. So after it's produced flowers and you notice that it's actually got uh, little tomatoes formed, then you can fertilize it again. And then every three to four weeks after that. So these are heavy feeders so they do need that nutrient and it's very important to have a the optimal you know, production. You want as many tomatoes and as many healthy tomatoes as you can get. Make sure they have that nutrition. Peppers and eggplant, they need to be fertilized at planting, again at the first fruit set, and then at, you're done after that. So they'll be good for the season. And potatoes, and then at planting, and then again when the plants are six to 10 inches tall. So again, just two feedings. Uh, the little side dress coming in after the plants are a little taller. So then we go back to the plant spacing again and also whether or not they need to be staked. Most of these are kind of vining plants so they don't tend to be able to support themselves very well. So they need staking to hold them up. Egg plants need to go about 18 to 36 inches between the plants. Again, read the variety information. Peppers 12 to 18 inches. Tomatoes 18 to 24, and then potatoes 9 to 12 inches. And then for staking, eggplants may or may not be, need to be staked. Again, read that the variety of information. Peppers, usually they don't need to be staked, but that again is very dependent on the variety. Uh, tomatoes, typically they do need to be staked, unless you're in a hanging basket and they're hanging down. Uh, but other than that, you don't want these things to be on the ground because the, uh, the fungus, the disease, the pest will get to them much more easily. And potatoes, no, you don't need to stake those. And then days of harvest, how long is it going to take you to actually get any fruit from these things? Now, if you look at the asterisk, it means this is days after transplanting. So, you know, once you get it up, this might be four to six weeks before they're ready to go in the garden. But once you put them in the garden, you can expect to harvest your first eggplant about 80 to 85 days later. Peppers 60 to 80, tomatoes 60 to 75, and then potatoes 90 to 120 days. Now the neat thing about the eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes is that you'll have a nice continual harvest throughout the season, but you won't expect your first um, fruits until these, this amount of time later. So when do you want to harvest these things? When you Looking at your eggplant, you want young fruit and it should still be glossy. So look at the outside of the, the fruit and you still have that nice shiny uh, sheen to it. That means it's ready to go. Once they get a little older and mature, they'll, they'll lose that waxy coating. The seeds are set, they're actually more ready to fall on the ground and start the decomposition process to spread those seeds around. It's, it's gone too far. You really want that younger fruit. Peppers, you actually have to pay attention Again, this is what I'm talking about. You have to pay attention to what it's supposed to be. Peppers are kind of strange, because you can, you can pick them at any time during their life, but whether or not they're ready is, is kind of a different story. They'll still have a flavor, they'll still be edible, but bell peppers, when we think about green bell peppers, they're just immature. Bell peppers, if left on the, the vine long enough, will turn eventually orange, yellow, and then red, uh, so, and you can still pick them at those stages, and they'll have slightly different flavor profiles at each, uh, at each stage, but you have to know what you're really looking for. Even things like uh, jalapenos, if you leave them on the vine long enough, they'll turn this beautiful shade of red. Tomatoes, for peat flavor and performance and, and taste, you want the fruit to be colored, you want that to be all red, and nice and slow, firm, but slightly soft. You can pick tomatoes as soon as you get that first flush of red. As soon as you see a little bit of um, blushing on the side, you can pick that tomato, put it on a windowsill, and it will uh, mature still. It just may not quite have the, those really good flavors that you're looking for. But the nice thing about that is it's less likely to get pesticide damage on it as well. So, I mean, pests 
damage. That's speeding damage. Uh, if you pick it a little early and let it develop inside, they won't be able to damage it and feed on it. Uh, potatoes, if you want small new potatoes, you actually pick those, you're going to dig those two to three weeks after the flowering stops. If you want to pay attention to what's going on when you see those flowers stop, then two to three weeks later the, the uh, potatoes will be ready. If you want nice, bigger, mature potatoes, you wait two to three weeks after the foliage has died. So in the, in the fall, when all, those, when all the leaves die down, you wait a little bit, you go out there to the shelf and dig them up, and you get all your potatoes at once. And then we're going to go back to Anna to do the pests, and we'll talk about that. Hey class, let's dig into some of the insect pests that attack our solanaceous crops. There's going to be a lot of the, um, a lot of overlap with the last lecture with the Nicole crops and the brassicas. Uh, some of these things like just about everything. They're generalist feeders, so you're going to see them pop up in different parts of your garden and on many of your crops. So first and foremost, our good friends the aphids, they're back. Um, a little bit different here where the ones that tend to attack our solanaceous crops fall into two categories more or less, the melon aphids and the green peach aphids. Now you'll remember the peach aphids from the coal crop lecture. The melon aphid is a new one that we're throwing into the mix. Uh, they are feeding on the underside of the leaves generally, or sometimes they're in almost like the crown or the tender new growth of our solanaceous crops. That's generally where we tend to see them. The damage is the same as you would observe in your brassicas as well. Um, you get that kind of curled, cupped, misshapen leaf, maybe with some chlorotic blotching on top. Remember, anytime you see that kind of symptom in your garden, take and look at the underside of those leaves and see if you can find what's causing it. They can transmit viruses. This is a huge problem in solanaceous crops, and Dr. Joe will kind of dig into that a little bit in the next section. And the control for your solanaceous crops um, is going to be the same as if you were treating them with your coal crops. That's your insecticidal soaps, your oils, your horticultural oil, your neem oil, malathion. And again, remember, your beneficial insects are your first line of defense against aphids in your home garden. So your lace wings, your lady beetles, your parasitic wasps. Make sure you've got good habitat and lots of places for those guys to hang out and breed, and they're going to naturally keep your aphids in check. Next up is the white flies. This is a big problem this time of year in New Orleans. It's hot and it's humid. There's a huge explosion in the white fly population right now. We get a lot of calls about it. There's a few different kinds. Um, the greenhouse white fly is a very common one. They're very, very, very small. So when we're saying flies, these are not the size of house flies. They're very, very, very small, almost like an aphid size. But when you move your plants, they tend to fly up in a cloud all around you and in your face. Very annoying. Um, the sweet potato white fly is another one that we see. Uh, the damage for the white flies, what they're going to cause is that leaf stippling. Remember that word stippling? We talked about that earlier, where the leaf looks like it's been pinpricked. That's from their feeding damage. And they also vector a number of diseases as well. So it's really not the feeding damage so much that you need to worry about with white flies. It's them getting something vectored into your crop that you don't want, that's where a lot of damage can really occur. Controlling them is a little hard because like I said, anytime you disturb where they're hanging out, they tend to fly off in all directions, very much like our flea beetles jumping off in all directions. You can use neem, you can use horticultural oil, insecticidal soap, that's usually what I would reach for in my garden, or pyrethrins. Pyrethrins do work pretty well on them as well. Now you're probably going to have to hit them a few times because again they do move around and they're kind of hard to control. Lepidopteran caterpillars, there's going to be a lot of overlap here as well. Remember there's our boring brown moth. If you see a boring brown moth in your garden, chances are pretty good it's a pest species. The beet army worm is one that we talked about in the last module. They will attack our solanaceous crops as well. And you can see the feeding damage, it's those irregular shaped holes, sometimes they have like a brown edge to them where it gets a little crispy, that's caterpillar damage. And again, look for that frass. Frass, just a fancy word for poop. If you see that frass, you know you've got a caterpillar problem. Control them with their BT, with spinosad, carbaryl, there's a lot of options, remember, 
controlling caterpillars is pretty easy. They're soft bodied, they don't have a hard exoskeleton, they don't run away very fast, so as long as you stay on top of it with a good routine, you can control your caterpillar pest species. The fall armyworm, we're fixing to get into these guys here locally. Um, it's a black caterpillar with a, uh, or a brown caterpillar with a black stripe, and these guys really do travel in packs, hence the word armyworm. So you'll usually see more than one hanging out in an area. The moth is a brown moth. Um, they do eat the leaves, but the thing about armyworms is they will also attack and gouge the fruits of your solanaceous crops as well. A lot of times we'll get calls with a picture of a tomato or an eggplant or a pepper that looks like this, and people wonder, well, is it rats or squirrels or birds? What's eating my crops? And oftentimes, it's an armyworm. They will nibble like that on the fruit. Control them like you would your other caterpillar species. Lots of options there as well. This guy is a really cool guy. The tomato and tobacco hornworm. Now, a lot of people don't realize that we've got actually two species of hornworms that go after our solanaceous crops. And you can tell them apart by the color of that horn on their end. So I think it's the, the tobacco hornworm it is bluish, and the tomato hornworm is orangey, kind of red colored. And that's how you would actually tell them apart. And then they've also got these white stripes on the sides of them. And you can tell them apart from that patterning as well. Um, they do turn into a sphinx moth which a lot of people like in their gardens, they're very beautiful moths. Um, but just one of these guys can do a whole lot of damage and take out a plant almost overnight. I've seen it happen many, many times. You walk outside in the morning and you're like, what the heck happened? And sure enough, you've got a four inch long, very fat caterpillar that had a buffet in your garden overnight and did a lot of damage. So these guys, you can pick them off to control them. Um, chickens love them. So they can be a chicken treat. They make good fishing bait as well. Um, but you can also control them with your BT or any other product in the garden also. The tomato fruit worm. Now these guys I really hate. They're called fruit worms because they do burrow into your tomatoes and other solanaceous crops and eat them from the inside out. So you might have what looks like a perfect tomato, just turning pink, ready to pick, and then it's got one little hole and you're like, oh, no big deal, I'll cut it off, I can still cook with that tomato. But then you slice into that tomato and it's full of these guys. It's really gross. <laughs> They're really hard to control once they get into that tomato, there's really nothing you can do. So your best option is to keep them off the plants in the first place. And you can do that with your BT, your spinosad, or any other options. Um, parasitic wasps will actually attack these and the tomato hornworms and lay their eggs on them. And then when they're ready to um, hatch out of the, the caterpillar, you'll see these white, almost like grains of rice along the back of the caterpillar. And those are actually the cocoons of the wasp kind of popping out of the caterpillar. It's gross. But if you see that in your garden, leave it because each and every one of those wasps is going to go and lay its eggs on more caterpillars and naturally control your caterpillars. So that's a really good thing if you see that in the garden. Um, you can see the damage from the fruit worm usually in the base of the fruit or around the stem. That's why a lot of people miss it until it's too late. Um, tunneling is evident because the, the cavity will be kind of full of frass or poop. They're in there pooping, it's gross. And then the fruit will kind of rot as the worm works its way through as well especially in hot, humid weather, so if you go to pick that tomato that looks right, it's basically mush, and that's fruit work damage. So hemipterans, now hemipterans really, really love our solanaceous crops. They evolved to host and feed on these things. In the wild, they'd be on our nightshades, our ground cherries, a lot of native plants um, in the solanaceous family. And like I said, just about anything will go after your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants. We've got the brown stink bug, we've got this, the southern green stink bug is a huge problem here locally. The brown marmorated stink bug, and we all know what a stink bug looks like, and we've all seen these guys, and then when you mess with them, they have that odor. That's a stink bug. Um, the damage, it's often these misshapen fruits with a lot of little pock marks, and those pock marks turn a different color, usually yellow or a darker color green if it's a younger tomato. And that's from them putting their piercing, sucking mouth parts into the fruit 
to suck up the plant juices, and then they actually transmit a yeast back into the fruit, and that's what causes that damage. So it's fermenting a little and rotting a little in there. Um, really hard to control these guys as well. Hand removal in a home garden is a good strategy. Again, that's where I'm using my cup full of soapy water every morning. I'm knocking them into there, they drown. It's very satisfying. <laughs> you can also use natural predators, um, insecticidal soap, neem, aminochloride, pyrethrins. There's a lot of things you can use. But once the adults are actually formed and they have that exoskeleton, they're very, very fast as well. Minochloride and kale and clay are kind of your best bets. So once they do mature, a lot of our kind of go-to insecticides are no longer as effective as when they were nymphs. I like the kale and clay because it does mask your plants and they can't see or sense it to feed. And that's a good organic control that a lot of larger growers will use. So you might want to look into that if you've got a lot of tomatoes, a lot of peppers, a lot of eggplants. That can be a good control management option for you. Another connector in the leaf-footed bugs. A lot of people get these guys confused with stink bugs, but they're actually their own thing. Um, we've got the leaf-footed bug, we've got southeastern U.S. species. They can be big, they can be a little smaller. The nymphs are usually this bright orange color. People get them confused with our beneficial milkweed assassin bug a lot. But you can tell, even at this young age, that they're leaf-footed bugs because they have a flare that looks like a leaf on their back pair of legs. So you can always tell them apart. They tend to congregate like this on leaves, on fruit. You can knock them off, you can squish them at this age pretty easy. Um, but they do the same kind of damage that your stink bugs would do where they're using their piercing sucking mouth parts to get in and suck the fruit juice out of your crops. And they transmit that yeast from their guts into the fruit. Very gross. Um, the hard tissue be beneath the fruit skin, it, kind of, it does get kind of gross and hard. You can still cook with that tomato, you can still eat that tomato. You can cut off the outer edges if you wanted to, but it does uh, kind of break your heart when these guys take over. Another good strategy for controlling them that we haven't mentioned is uh, with trap crops. Stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs are attracted to sunflowers. So if you've got an area of your yard that gets a lot of sun away from your tomatoes, plant a stand of sunflowers. They'll actually prefer to host on that. You know, they don't do as much damage on the sunflowers, so that's a trap crop. And you can actually go in there and vacuum them off. We have a lot of schools doing that. It's really cool. So that's another control option as well. The thysanopterans, or thrips, for you lay people, I say thrips. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of different ones that will go after our solanaceous crops. First and foremost, the tobacco thrips. If you think about tobacco as a crop, it's actually a solanaceous crop as well. So tobacco thrips will go after your eggplant, your tomatoes, your peppers as well. Western flower thrips will get in there. And thrips are very, very small. They're hard to see. Um, usually I have to use a little hand lens to actually get in there and see if there's a thrip problem. They're only one or two millimeters long. So the females are usually brown and black, the males are almost always yellow or colored, and they have fringed wings. Um, they're not traditional leaf-shaped wings or round wings, they're almost like little um, like hands, like fringed, and that's how they get around. They travel in the wind for very long distances. They can distort young growth on your young transplants. Um, they can cause flower drop, they get in there and they feed on the buds and the flowers and then all your flowers end up on the ground. If you take a close look at them, you might have thrips. Um, fruit scarring, this is an eggplant here in the bottom that's got kind of a crackle pattern to it. That's thrip damage from when that eggplant was forming after pollination. It's a young, tender place for them to feed. They've gotten in there and fed, and now as that eggplant continues to grow, the damaged skin kind of shows that crackled appearance. So that's a giveaway for them as well. There are a lot of natural predators for thrips. Um, our ladybugs, our uh, lace wings will eat them. Um, but one of the best ways to control them is by controlling the weeds in your garden where they might hide. So that's a good way of ensuring that they can't stay around. Hmm? What? Viruses, they're biggie. Oh, yeah, viruses. 
A good way of controlling them too is to make sure your garden is very sanitary and that you don't have a lot of weeds for them to host on. Um, they do vector disease as well, so you do want to make sure that you have them under control. A lot of viruses are transmitted by thrips. You can use carb grill on them also, but that's a little harsher in our gardens. Um, you know, prevention is a, a good way of going about it and ensuring that you have a lot of beneficials in the area as well. Leaf beetles. We're back to flea beetles. There are lots and lots of different kinds of flea beetles. These are just some of the kinds of flea beetles. They're just as hard to control in your solanaceous crops as they are in your coal crops. A lot of the same um, kind of control issues. They're very fast. They do cause that kind of buckshot stippling pattern on their on the leaves as they feed, where you can hold the leaf up and it looks like little pin pricks shining through. That's flea beetle damage. We have the tobacco flea beetle, the southern tobacco flea beetle, the pale stripe, the eggplant flea beetle. These things love eggplants. Um, it's hard to find an eggplant in the greater New Orleans area that doesn't have some flea beetle damage. The good news is, is that they won't usually kill the plant. They will feed. There is a threshold where they're somewhat harmless. They're not really impacting the growth of the plant or the production of eggplants. So, you know, you gotta kind of keep an eye on things, make sure your population doesn't boom. But especially in an organic garden, you have to accept some damage. And this is one case where you do have to accept some damage and that that's gonna occur. Remember, the adults feed on the top part of the, the plants and the larvae are down in the roots. So you're getting a one-two punch with the flea beetles. And they're very, very fast, so spraying them is hard. They flip onto the underside of the leaves. Neem oil works, carb oil, pyrene rings, imidacloprid, and that kale and clay will actually help mask the plants from the flea beetles as well. That's a really good control. Colorado potato beetle. Now, it says potato beetle, but they will go after other solanaceous crops as well. They just prefer potatoes. And when they're young, they are almost like a thing out of an alien movie. Uh, they're orange, very soft bodied. That's when they're the most easy to control because they're not very fast. They can't fly at that stage. They're very big and they're conspicuous. They stand out in the garden and they chew up the leaves, very similar to what a caterpillar would do. So you do have to kind of stay on top of things, get out there, scout, look at your garden daily, and if you catch these early, you can pick them off into a container of soapy water and get your infestation under control very quickly. Um, the adult beetle is kind of pretty to look at. It's this sort of um, black and orange or black and yellow striped pattern. It is a true coleopteran, it's a beetle. Uh, five lines on each side with light tan lines in between. The head is kind of an oranger color and they can fly. That's how they're moving from place to place is that they're flying, they're sensing where you've got a nice potato patch that attracts them like a magnet. So be out there scouting. The plants can get defoliated very quickly by these guys if you let them get out of control. If you're growing potatoes somewhere where you're not attending to it on a regular basis, don't be surprised if you come back one day and you find your plants stripped bare and all that's left is the stalks. Very good chance it's potato beetles. You can control them um, with means, finisad, and a couple of other things. It's a fungus. Oh, it's a fungus. You spray on it. And it, it's good. It works. Okay. You can control them with neem and spinosad, especially when they're young, soft-bodied still. Um, but there is a fungal product that you can Google. Um, that's this one right here. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but you can look into that product. It's a fungus that will attack the beetle, and it's a good natural control method. Um, I think there's even some beneficial nematodes that will work on these guys as well. So be looking into those natural remedies. Last but not least, the mites. We have two spotted spider mites in our area, especially when it's hot and humid out. And if you notice, they're making a web on the plants, and a lot of times we'll get a call saying, I think these spiders are killing my plants. Well, it's not true spiders, it's mites, which remember are also arachnids, if you remember that from our insect lecture. The two-spotted spider mite is too small to see with the naked eye, but it does have two spots to it if you were to get out a microscope. Um, they're actively feeding, and that's what's causing that stippling on the leaf. This is an egg 
eggplant leaf up in the top left hand corner and you'll see where it looks like somebody's dotted it. It's all white on the edges. If you flip that leaf over, you're going to see some webbing from those spider mites. It's a dead giveaway that you've got them. Um, they do cause a lot of wilt. Also, if you think this leaf is damaged, it's losing extra water, they're sucking plant juices out of the plant. Um, so it can cause some, some wilting, some desiccation. It can cause these leaves to fall off, especially in hot, humid weather. Distortion, and then that telltale webbing. That's how you know they're there. You can control them with predatory mites, so fighting mites with other mites. That's always cool. Neem oil is pretty effective because it smothers them, but you gotta get good coverage. And then there's a few other options in the chemical realm. You can get a miticide. And remember in our pesticide lectures, we talked about miticides that work on mites. And with that, Dr. Joe's gonna talk to you about diseases. Thanks, Anna, great job. Chris, good job. Now people know how to grow them. They know a few of the insects they gotta watch out for. So what I'm gonna do is tell you about some of the more common diseases. Now, I'm gonna put this slide up here, not to scare you off from growing the solanaceous crops, but just to let you know that there are some things that we have to be looking out for. Uh, for instance, the American Phytopathological Society, this is just for tomatoes, they list 13 bacterial diseases that you have to watch out for in the U.S., three phytoplasma diseases, 33 different fungal diseases, that can attack just tomatoes we're talking about right now. 20 viral diseases, six viral diseases, and even four different nematodes that will attack your tomatoes. So, I put this up here to let you know, there's a lot of things that like your tomatoes besides you. And we're gonna only hit some, highlight some of the more common ones that you're probably gonna run into uh, in your garden. Uh, and just to give you an idea, you know, once again, Identify, identify. Know what you're dealing with before you try to control it. Or go ahead and get some resistant varieties to eliminate some of the possibilities. So keep that in mind as we go through these different diseases that you may see, hopefully not very often, in your garden. The first one is um, some early blight disease. Now this one, it's again, it's a fungal disease. It attacks tomatoes and potatoes. And as you can see, like with the alternaria that we had earlier uh, on the last one, when I talked about alternaria leaf spot, well, early blight is also caused by the fungal disease, I mean the fungus alternaria. Uh, there's the to tomato one, you just, uh, alternaria solani, and the one that attacks potatoes, alternaria alternata. And you have those concentric greens showing up again on your leaf. They can also attack the fruit and the stem, but that concentric green pattern surrounded by the yellow halo, that's pretty uh, emblematic of what the early blight will do to your plants. So you see that? Don't automatically assume it's early blight, but that's narrowing it down for you. And so you can go ahead and then start trying to identify a little bit further. And the best way to control early blight is to plant resistant varieties. Now, um, there are some varieties out there and they're making improvements on developing more resistant varieties uh, to early blight, but that's one good way uh, to avoid early blight problems is to grow resistant varieties. Now, if you're growing something that aren't resistant, uh, Mancozab and Chlorophyllin are two chemical products that will help to protect your plants from early blight infection. Uh, another common disease, go from early blight to late blight. <laughs> now this is one that um, has been, um, for years, historically has been blamed for uh, the Irish potato famine that resulted in a lot of people from Ireland migrating to other countries, especially the US. And late blight, occurs later in the season. It does affect tomato and potato. Now, this is once again, we talked to you about you know, the different disease names. We have early blight, and we have late blight. So you think those two are kind of related to each other. And as we saw earlier, early blight is called by a fungus, alternaria. Late blight is also called by a fungus, but it's not even close to being uh, alternaria. It's phytophthora, phytophthora infestans. 
And of course, nowadays, these uh, Phytophthora pitch and things like that, they are called fungal-like organisms or water molds. Um, they used to be definitely, they call them fungus. Now they say, eh, we're not so sure that they're a true fungus when we call them fungal-like. I'm gonna call that a fungus. Late light is called by the fungus Phytophthora infestans. Uh, it appears on all the above ground parts of the plant. You can see the lesions on the leaf up there in the upper right. You can see lesions on uh, the lower right. Uh, those huge necrotic spots. Uh, they start out looking water soaked to begin with, then they'll turn uh, into uh, necrotic spots. And the disease develops very, very rapidly. Uh, as you can see there on, the, on this slide, uh, the plant eventually, I mean, it dies, and it dies really fast really fast. Um, the best way to control it is to get rid of the diseased and infected plants as quickly as possible. There are some resistant varieties. Uh, put that slide up there. The tubers, you can see how they're infected and, and they're, they're essentially useless as far as food goes. And that's what was happening to uh, the Irish, during the Irish potato famine was the, the mainstay, the main staple of the, of the people uh, was inedible, so there were no potatoes for them to eat. Uh, there are some chemicals you can use, um, chlorothalonil, megazed, copper, when you're protecting the, the upper parts of the plant. Uh, but once again, try to grow the resistant varieties. As we try to emphasize in all of these uh, classes and all these lectures, in a lot of cases there are some chemicals available, but the chemical control wants to be your last choice. When, that, when everything else fails, then you may want to try the chemical or you may want to say, okay, I'm just not going to grow this anymore or <laughs> this crop is, is trash. But there are chemicals that are available to control the uh, Another common disease that we see a lot down here, hence the name Southern Light, it's another fungal disease caused by Sclerotium rothschii. And this is a soil borne disease. So the fungus lives in the soil and it makes these uh, very hard, black, round survival bodies called sclerotia. And that's the way it survives in the soil. It can survive for years in the soil. Uh, these little mustard seed sized um, bodies from that the fungus is making, which is its survival mechanism. And a lot of times you'll see that as a symptom. You'll see, as you see on the two pictures on the right, uh, there's the fungus that's developing right at the root line, the soil line. That's where it uses corrosion will attack. And as it, as it goes on and on, it'll start to develop the sclerotia. You'll actually see those little black uh, seed-like spots all over the, the stems where the fungus is growing. Uh, the plant there in the Center, you can see it's a tomato plant, totally wilted down. What's happened is uh, the fungus has destroyed the transport system of the plant, so water can't get up, uh, food can't get down to the roots because the plant has been uh, destroyed, the roots and the stem right at the ground level has been girdled and killed by the fungus, and, and hence the, the wilting that results. The name blight just looks like suddenly there's death. The plant goes wilty and never will recover. Now for uh, southern light, there are no registered fungicides that you can use. So chemical control is not an option with this one. Um, so when the symptoms are first seen, you want to get rid of those plants immediately. Uh, and if it's really bad, you may want to actually replace the soil. If you're doing a raised bed and you start to get southern light problems, the best way to get rid of it is to actually get rid of the soil and bring in new soil. And soil solarization, we've talked about that before, especially in the plant pathology sections, and we gave you uh, some supplemental material that tells the actual method and exact way of doing soil solarization, because if you don't do it right, it's a waste of time. But if you have that supplemental material, uh, that's one way of helping to control Southern light in the soil is doing soil solarization. Uh, if you do it right, you can get the temperature high enough to kill the sclerotia. Uh, now some other leaf diseases, uh, Cercopsis for leaf spot, 
on the eggs, called a Sarcospora leaf spot, usually with its own eggplant, frog eye leaf spot on pepper. It's actually two different uh, fungi. They're both Sarcospora. One's melangeny and the other is capsicin. Of course, capsicin would be the pepper one, melangeny would be the one that's attacking the eggplant. And you'll see those initial symptoms will be uh, a dark necrotic spot, and a lot of times you'll have that center uh, that's a lighter color. Uh, some, there may be a halo, there may not be, and uh, you'll have those concentric zones again. That's often the case with some of these fungal leaf diseases. Uh, severely infected plants will have uh, a lot of leaves curling up. The entire leaf will get chlorotic, will be covered by these necrotic spots, they'll drop off. Um, once again, sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. When you see this happening, get rid of those leaves. Don't even wait for them to drop off. Go ahead and remove them from the plant if you're going to try to save the plant. Or if it's severely infected, remove the plant itself, get rid of it. Because all that's doing, if you leave it, is creating more problems because the fungus is going to make spores, and create inoculum that's going to spread to your other plants. There are a couple of chemicals that will work with uh, Cercospora spots, uh, Mancozeb, Chlorothalamin again. Chlorothalamin is going to see a lot for fungal control in vegetables. Um, so you want to, like I said, get rid of the disease leaves as soon as possible. One problem that can result from heavy leaf infection with uh, special peppers, you see that a lot, is the foliage will drop and now the fruit is exposed to the sun. So even though the fruit may still be healthy looking, once the leaves drop off, there's nothing to protect the fruit from sunburn or sun skull. And we'll get calls a lot of times, what's wrong with my fruit? And you'll see these um, burned sections on the pepper and it's sun skull is what's causing it. There's no disease really there. It's an abiotic disorder caused because there's no longer any leaf uh, or foliage cover to protect the fruits. Um, there's are some bacterial diseases, bacterial spot, and you can see now with these different leaf spotting diseases, they look very similar a lot of times. It's a dark spot, necrotic lesion with yellow halos around it. Fungus will do it. Bacteria will do it. Even viruses will cause this symptom sometimes. So once again, you want to make sure you identify what the problem is before you try to take care of it so that you don't waste your time and your energy and that you get good results. The bacterial leaf spot is called by bacterium xanthomonas, and it's a seed-borne bacterium that affects tomatoes and pepper. So one good control is use certified disease-free seed. That's one way you're going to control this disease. You're starting clean. Start clean, stay clean. Uh, there are some resistant varieties that are available. So uh, with these bacterial diseases, prevention is the main control. Because once it's there, you're not going to get rid of it. So prevent it from coming, and then you've got control. Using resistant varieties, disease-free seed, and disease-free transplants, that's what you want to do to help you control these. And with most all these diseases, with the fungal diseases on any crop, with the bacterial diseases on any crop, avoid overhead watering as much as possible. We can't emphasize that enough. Overhead watering, you're just wetting the leaf surface, which is creating a great environment for bacteria and for fungi. And the longer the leaf surface stays wet, the more they like it. And when you're overhead watering, you're splashing. You're creating, um, you're spreading a disease. You're splashing spores, you're splashing bacteria. So overhead watering, in most cases, is not a good idea. Avoid it as much as possible. And there are some copper-based fungicides you can spray. This is a prophylactic treatment. What you're doing with that is simply protecting your plants. Um, the case where you might want to use the copper-based fungicides uh, as a prophylactic to protect your plants from the bacteria is if you have several eggplants or several tomatoes or several peppers growing in your garden and you notice the disease on one, get rid of the disease and then you can use the copper-based fungicide to spray to protect those that aren't showing the disease yet. They may have it, they may not, and that's where you're using it. Like I said, prophylactically, 
to prevent disease infection. You know that it's there, you know the disease pressure is there because you had a disease plant. You got rid of that disease plant, but now to protect the others, you might want to use those copper sprays. Southern bacterial wilt, that's another uh, bacterial disease which affects, infects all of the solanaceous crops. Tomato, pepper, eggplant, potato, all of them can be infected by uh, Rolstonia solanaceum. That's a bacterium that is a uh, soil-borne bacterium and it is pretty devastating once your plants get it. You can see on the, on the slides the pictures there. Uh, and this is going to be the case with almost any uh, plant. If you cut the stem open and there's discoloration in it, 99 out of 100 times it's got a disease. The inside of a plant stem should be nice and white or a very light green color, no dark discoloration. If you have dark discoloration, then you most likely got a disease. In this case, it's the southern bacterial wilt that we're showing up here. And that will plug up all the transport mechanisms in the plant and then you'll get the, the heavy wilting as you see right here. Sometimes your plants will actually, in the evening or early morning, they will look like uh, normal. They will be very turgy with their leaves up in the air. And as soon as the sun comes up and they start to have a higher demand for water, they will wilt. And no matter how much the soil is wet, they just won't recover. And that's a, in this case, a bacterial infection, southern bacterial wilt. And the plants will wilt and die very rapidly if they have uh, back southern bacterial infection. And as I said, it's a soil-borne bacterium, so once it's in the soil, it's hard to get rid of. So try to avoid it as much as possible. If you have disease plants, get rid of them as quickly as possible. Try to get the root system out as well. Don't just cut the plant off and get rid of it. Try to get as much of those roots of, and get rid of those because it's actually in the roots. You want to get rid of everything that you can to help you clean the soil up. Soil sterilization again is, is going to work. Um, there are no resistant varieties to southern bacterial wilt. However, there are some resistant rootstocks. Once again, going back to the plant pathology lecture, we talked about doing grafting as a way of controlling disease, breaking the disease cycle. Uh, with southern bacterial wilt, uh, there are some resistant rootstocks available that you can graft your uh, top onto. So you have a resistant root, and even though the top is susceptible, as um, Mary Ellen mentioned, um, when you plant those, you're doing grafting, you want to make sure you don't plant the graft below the soil line. If you do, you just uh, defeated the purpose. But grafting, and using grafted plants on resistant rootstock is uh, one way to be able to grow uh, the crops in soil that has this bacterium in it. Uh, and there are no registered pesticides to use to prevent southern bacterial growth. Uh, now, there are some fruit problems that are very common. This one, if you've ever grown eggplant, you've probably seen this one. And I know I grow them even in, um, when I'm doing things to protect it. This seems to always show up sometimes. Uh, probably because I uh, slipped in late and missed uh, a treatment or something to prevent it. But uh, the Phomopsis fruit rot, Phomopsis blight, this is primarily a disease on eggplants. It affects all the above ground parts of the plant. Uh, as you can see here, we have a stem. It's heavily infected. Uh, all those necrotic lesions, that's caused by uh, the, back, the uh, fungi uh, Phomopsis, Phomopsis mexans. Uh, you can see over here why it's called uh, a blight or a wilt. The plant is totally gone uh, because of this infection. Uh, you can see on the leaves, this is where I see it and where I hate the most of when I see it on my eggplant fruit. And that is very, very, very symptomatic of what the uh, Phomopsis fruit crop looks like on the eggplants. You see, once again, there's some concentric circles there. Uh, it's uh, brown, uh, sunken lesions. Um, and once you see that, you want to get rid of those disease portions as soon as you possibly can uh, because um, the Phomopsis will 
persist in seed, so money control mechanisms is using a certified disease-free seed to overwinter in plant residue in the soil. Uh, and when it's on that plant residue, when it's on the fruit, when it's on the leaves, when it's on the stems, as it matures, it starts to sporulate. So those spores are easily spread by splashing water. Again, avoid overhead irrigation. All you're doing is splashing and spreading problems around. Uh, there are some resistant varieties available that you can plant. So if you want to uh, go that route, go ahead and choose some resistant varieties. Once again, as we told you, seed catalogs are really, really good about listing what diseases the varieties are selling are resistant to. So that will be in the seed catalog. So that's where you can find out uh, whether uh, the variety you're interested in is resistant to uh, the Phomopsis fruit rot. Uh, and then there are some uh, fungicides available, the Mancozeo, uh, and copper are once again uh, effective against uh, Phomopsis fruit rot and Phomopsis blight. And anthracnose fruit rot, again, um, this is attacking the parts that we're interested in getting and eating, the fruits that affects pepper, tomato, eggplant, and potato. Now this is one which is really interesting because uh, it's affecting everything that we want to eat. Uh, and as Chris told you earlier, tomato, eggplant, and pepper, we're after the fruits. Uh, with potato, uh, we're after the underground storage stems, uh, the specialized stems that are underground. But polycopricum will attack all of these. Now, I put this up there as polycopricum species because the different species that attack different plants, but they're all um, the polycopricum fungus. And you'll have this, these sunken lesions that you can see on the tomato fruit, the pepper fruit. Um, you can see on the pepper fruit below the bell pepper there, there's red peppers, even you can see it. Now, you can see there is a difference in this case on the eggplant between um, the anthracnose fruit rot and the phomopsis fruit rot, which you saw earlier. Uh, with the eggplant, there are brown lesions, they aren't quite as sunken, they don't look as quite as devastating, but they are just as bad. And on the potato tubers, as you can see, <coughs> that uh, the potatoes are damaged because essentially it's infecting the stem of the potato. The potato tubers are underground specialized storage stems, so it can affect all the above ground parts, in this case. The stems, you know, the below ground, it's still a stem, and it's infecting the potatoes. And it is uh, survived in the soil, can also survive uh, on the seed, and it can survive in plant debris. Once again, sanitation. So start clean by getting certified disease-free uh, plants, seeds, certified, certified disease-free tubers if you're going to grow potatoes. So you're starting clean and then stay clean. Sanitation. Get rid of the plant debris as soon as it uh, drops. You see fruit that is infected, get those off, get rid of them as soon as possible. And don't let any infected leaves drop and stay on the ground. Get rid of them. And avoid overhead watering. Avoid overhead watering. Did I say it yet? Avoid overhead watering. That's never a good idea in your vegetable garden. So, um, Mulching is another good way to prevent that soil splashing. Like I said, it is can be in the soil. So as we told you earlier, breaking the disease cycle of mulch is a good way of doing that. Because what you're doing is you're preventing the you know, splashing of the spores up onto the plant. Now I told you, you know, I told you about, about avoiding the red watering. That's always a good idea. But when it rains, it rains. So there's nothing you can do about that unless you have your plants growing in a greenhouse, but mulching is a good way to prevent the rain from splashing those um, diseased spores up on your plant. So mulching is always a good idea. And of course, as Anna mentioned earlier, uh, with a lot of the insects, one of the big problems they cause is virus transmission. They are vectors of viral diseases. And here are some common viral diseases that uh, you'll see. Tomato spotted with a virus, that one infects tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and potatoes. 
Thrips, the biggest problem with thrips is that they are a vector of the tomato spotty globulitis. That's the biggest damage that the thrips cause is they spread that virus to all the plants. Um, symptoms from that, your plants will be stunted, as you can see on that leaf in the center there. They can be misshapen, distorted, <clears throat> and cut. Um, this one, what it's trying to show you here are the, the light spots and dark spots. You can see those uh, spots right here that are showing up in, with the kind of a dark um, halo around that spot. Light spots, dark spots. Um, that's a ring spot. That's why it's called tomato spotting world virus. We'll have some viruses that are called ring spot viruses because they give you something like that. That ring spot looks. You see on the fruit, uh, the fruit is damaged. It can even be misshapen if it's infected early. Uh, the fruit is not very palatable at this point. There you see it on the peppers. Uh, so the way you want to control uh, tomato spotty wood virus, the best control is using resistant varieties because the disease is so easily transmitted this virus that controlling the vector or the thrips isn't a great way uh, to control it. Um, with some other viruses, controlling the vector will help to control it, but if you can get resistant varieties, that's always the best way of preventing viral diseases. Now with eggplant, there are no resistant varieties. With the others, uh, tomato, pepper, and potato, there are resistant varieties. And as in all cases with diseased plants, get rid of them as soon as you see them. It's never a good idea to try to save a diseased plant. Most of the time, you're going to end up with just spreading the disease to the rest of the plants. Even if you have only one, go ahead, get rid of it. Don't keep it around. It's just going to lead to more problems. Those, with most all of these diseases, once a plant's infected, it's going to stay infected. Uh, even if it's just uh, a leaf spot organism, uh, you can remove the leaves. That's getting rid of the diseased plant. Um, and once again, it's like knowing what disease you're dealing with. If it's something like a viral disease, it's systemic. Once the plant has it, it goes through all of the plant. It spreads everywhere. So there's nothing you can do to stop it once, once your plant has a viral disease. Now leaf spot disease, once again, it may spread, but if it's only on the surface like that, then what you're gonna need to do is get rid of those disease leaves as soon as possible. Viruses, once a plant's got it, it's got it. Get rid of the plant. Uh, here's another virus, the tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Again, it affects pet, tomato, pepper, eggplant, and potato. Now this one is vectored by white flies. As Anna mentioned earlier, you know, there's some um, problems that white flies will cause, but the biggest problem you're going to get from white fly on your solanaceous vegetable plants is that they vector viruses. In this case, we're talking about the tomato yellow leaf curl virus. Remember, we talked about the name of viruses and how usually it's the symptoms that give them their name? Well, look here, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. So, on your tomato plant, you're going to have yellow curled leaves. Those are symptoms of tomato yellow leaf curl virus. It does the same thing on peppers, eggplants, and potatoes. And once again, Resistant varieties is a great control mechanism. Go ahead and get resistant varieties. Uh, try to control the white flies. Remove the weeds. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. We talked about it in the weed lecture. We talked about it in the plant pathology lecture. Having weeds in the garden is never, never, never a good thing. They compete with your plant for the nutrients and the water. They may harbor diseases and insects. So getting rid of the weeds is one control mechanism for preventing diseases and insects on your garden plants. So control those weeds. Remove the diseased plants as soon as possible. Don't leave them there. Now, just like in the previous lecture, don't want to scare you out of trying to grow these solanaceous crops. Actually, tomato is grown in 85% of all home gardens grow tomatoes. That is the number one crop that people want to grow in their home garden. 
It's a solanaceous plant. As I told you earlier, the APS lists a lot of different diseases that can attack your tomato plants, but tasting that vine ripe tomato that you grew yourself, there's nothing that compares. And you can get this from your garden. Beautiful tomatoes, these are the red ones, or in this case, some of the heirlooms. You can have beautiful eggplant. You can have great peppers of all different types, of sweet, hot, in between, and all these different potatoes. So, once again, start clean, stay clean, prevent the insects, prevent the diseases, and you can have a beautiful crop just like this. So, stay with it. Love your solanaceous crops. Actually, in New Orleans right now, we're getting ready to start our second season with the solanaceous crops, especially the tomatoes. Down here, we go through a, a warm spring, then it gets really hot in the summer, and most everything stops. And then in the fall, because we have milder winters, we can actually have a second crop of solanaceous uh, vegetables. So we're getting ready to start that now, just so be prepared, start clean, stay clean, and enjoy your harvest.